Before we dive into our story, a quick reminder. Here at Woo English, we learn English through captivating stories. This tale is crafted with clear and simple sentences to enhance your learning experience. If you find this story helpful, please show your support by liking and commenting below. Your feedback motivates us to create more content like this. Remember, the purpose of our stories is educational. We aim to explore interesting characters and events without glorifying or endorsing them. Now, let's begin our journey into the story. Enjoy and learn. Chapter 1 The Roots of France An Introduction to Ancient Gaul and the Early Tribes of France Once upon a time, long before the Eiffel Tower graced the skyline of Paris, and centuries before the language of love was spoken, the land we now call France had a different story. This is a tale of ancient Gaul, a region inhabited by tribes brave and fierce, each with their own customs, traditions, and secrets. In these ancient times, the land was wild and untamed. Dense forests covered vast stretches where cities like Paris, Lyon, and Bordeaux now stand. Wild boars roamed freely, and rivers flowed through the landscapes, teeming with fish. The people of this era, the Gauls, were as rugged and free as the land itself. The Gauls were not a single tribe, but a collection of many tribes, each ruling over their piece of land. They were skilled warriors and farmers known for their strength and courage. The men wore trousers and cloaks dyed in vibrant colors from the plants and minerals found in their environment. The women, equally strong, often fought alongside the men, defending their homes and families with fierce determination. One might wonder, what did these ancient tribes believe? The Gauls had a profound connection with nature, worshipping many gods and goddesses that represented the forces of nature. Their priests, known as druids, held a respected position in society. These druids were not only religious leaders, but also the keepers of knowledge, including the laws, history, and medicinal secrets of their people. The story of ancient Gaul is also marked by its clashes with the Romans. Julius Caesar, the ambitious leader of the Roman Republic, set his eyes on Gaul, a land rich with resources and strategic advantages. In 58 BC, Caesar began a campaign to conquer Gaul, a series of events that would change the course of history. Imagine the scene, a misty morning in Gaul, where the local tribes had gathered to discuss the threat of Roman invasion. Among them stood a young warrior, Lutetia. Her heart was heavy with the knowledge that peace in Gaul was at risk. Lutetia was known for her swift thinking and bravery. On that day, she stood up and spoke passionately, rallying her people to unite against the common enemy. We are Gauls, children of the forest and river, warriors of the land that has always been ours. Let us not fall divided under the shadow of Rome. Lutetia's voice echoed through the woods, and her words stirred the hearts of all who heard her. The tribes decided to come together forming a grand alliance led by a charismatic leader named Vercingetorix. The United Gauls faced the Roman legions in many battles. One of the most famous confrontations was the Siege of Elysia, where Vercingetorix made a valiant stand against Caesar's forces. Despite their bravery and strength, the Gauls were ultimately besieged. Vercingetorix, showing immense honor, surrendered to save his people from further suffering. This moment marked the beginning of Roman rule over Gaul, but the spirit of the Gauls never truly died. Their fierce independence and deep connection to their land have been woven into the fabric of what we now know as France. As the sun sets on our story of ancient Gaul, remember that the roots of a nation are found not just in the victories or defeats of war, but in the spirit of its people. 
The Gaul's legacy lives on in the rolling hills of the French countryside, in the bustling streets of Paris, and in the hearts of those who cherish freedom and bravery. Chapter 2 Julius Caesar and Gaul The Roman Conquest and its Impact on the Region The story of Julius Caesar's conquest of Gaul is a tale of ambition, strategy, and profound transformation. This chapter unfolds during a time when Rome was extending its reach across the known world, eyeing the rich and varied landscapes of Gaul, which stretched from the rolling rivers in the south to the dense forests in the north. Julius Caesar, a name that echoed through the corridors of power in Rome, was not just a leader. He was a visionary with an insatiable appetite for expansion. In the year 58 BC, he looked towards Gaul, a land that was as fragmented in its tribal divisions as it was rich in resources. Caesar saw an opportunity not only for conquest, but also for making Rome the centre of the civilised world. The Gauls, known for their fierce independence and warrior spirit, were initially unaware of the impending storm that would soon engulf their lands. As Caesar's legions marched closer, the skies over Gaul seemed to grow heavier with the threat of invasion. The campaign began in the spring, a time when the forests of Gaul were coming alive with the new season. Caesar, with his legions, crossed the Rubicon a move that signified a point of no return. The Roman legions were well-trained, disciplined, and equipped with the finest armour and weapons of the era. In contrast, the Gauls, though brave and skilled in combat, were divided among themselves, which made them vulnerable to a well-organised force like Caesar's. As the Romans advanced, they encountered stiff resistance from the local tribes. One of the first major battles was near a river crossing, where the Gauls, led by a chieftain named Orgetorix, made a stand. Orgetorix was a man of great stature, known for his persuasive speech and valour in battle. He rallied his warriors with a fiery speech. Let the rivers of our homeland bear witness today. We are Gauls and no foreign invader shall claim our soil without a fight. The battle was fierce, with the clash of iron and the cries of warriors filling the air. However, the discipline of the Roman legions under Caesar's strategic command eventually overcame the gallant Gauls. Orgetorix fell, becoming a martyr to his people, and the Romans secured a crucial victory. With each conquest, Caesar's influence grew but so did the unrest among the Gauls. The fall of Orgetorix had ignited a flame of resistance across the region. The tribes began to see the value in unity against a common enemy. Under the leadership of Vercingetorix, whom we met briefly in our previous story, the Gauls united once more for a significant uprising. Vercingetorix was different from his predecessors. He understood that to resist Rome, the Gauls needed not only courage, but also strategy. He reformed the Gaulish armies, introduced better fortifications, and chose battlegrounds that were advantageous to his forces. The culmination of these efforts was the siege of Elysia, a fortified town where Vercingetorix made his stand. The siege was long and brutal. The Romans surrounded Elysia, building fortifications to prevent any escape or assistance from the outside. Inside the walls, food and water became scarce, and despair began to set in among the Gauls. In a bold move, Vercingetorix sent away his horse, choosing to share the fate of his foot soldiers. This act of solidarity was powerful, boosting the morale of his men. Despite their dire situation, the Gauls fought with a spirit, that was as fierce as the storms that often swept through their homeland. However, the might of Rome was too great. Eventually, the food stores ran out, and Vercingetorix, seeing the suffering of his people, decided to surrender to Caesar 
to save them from further hardship. This decision marked the end of major resistance in Gaul and solidified Roman control over the region. The impact of the Roman conquest on Gaul was profound. Roman culture, laws and language began to seep into Gaulish society. Towns like Lugdunum, modern-day Lyon, and Aquitania, modern-day Bordeaux, grew into centers of commerce and Roman administration. Roads were built, which connected Gaul more closely to the heart of Rome, and Latin became the lingua franca of the elite. Yet the spirit of the Gauls did not perish. Their traditions, language, and customs continued to thrive beneath the surface of Roman rule. The blend of Gaulish and Roman elements eventually gave rise to a unique cultural identity, one that would carry on through the centuries to form the foundation of modern France. Thus, the conquest of Gaul was not merely a tale of subjugation, but also a story of cultural synthesis, which, despite the hardships, enriched the tapestry of human civilization. Chapter 3 the birth of a nation, the Frankish kingdoms, and the establishment of the French identity. The story of France is a tapestry woven from the threads of many cultures and peoples. After the fall of the Roman Empire, a new chapter began in the land of Gaul, marked by the rise of the Frankish kingdoms. This was a time of warriors and kings, of shifting alliances, and the slow forging of a national identity that would one day blossom into modern France. As the Roman influence waned, the power vacuum left behind became a stage for new forces. Among these were the Franks, a confederation of Germanic tribes. They were fierce, determined, and ready to carve out a place for themselves in the annals of history. Their story is highlighted by one name that stands above others. Clovis. Clovis was not merely a warrior. He was a king with a vision. Born to the Merovingian dynasty around 466 AD, he inherited a kingdom that was one of many small Frankish territories. But Clovis had greater ambitions. He wanted to unite the Franks under one rule and expand his domain. The young king was known for his charisma and his ability to inspire loyalty among his followers. It was under his leadership that the Franks began to truly consolidate power. Through a combination of diplomacy, marriage, and outright conquest, Clovis gradually extended his influence over neighboring tribes. One of the most pivotal moments in Clovis's reign, and indeed a defining moment for the French nation, came with his conversion to Christianity. After winning a crucial battle against the Alemanni at Tolbiac in 496 AD, Clovis converted to Christianity, reportedly moved by a divine intervention he experienced during the fight. He was baptized on Christmas Day, which not only marked a personal transformation, but also a strategic move that aligned him with the powerful Christian church. This conversion had profound implications. It helped to unify the various Frankish tribes under one faith, strengthening the internal cohesion of the kingdom. Moreover, it linked the Franks with the broader Christian community in Europe, facilitating alliances with other Christian rulers and the church itself. Under Clovis, the legal system began to take shape as well. The Salic law, a written code, was established to replace the old tribal customs. This was a significant step towards a centralized state as it applied uniformly to all under Clovis's rule, providing a common legal framework that helped to mitigate disputes and unify the diverse peoples within his territories. After Clovis's death in 511 AD, his kingdom was divided among his four sons according to Frankish custom. While this division could have weakened the Frankish power, it instead laid the groundwork for future consolidation. The Merovingian dynasty, though marked by internal strife, continued to play a crucial role in the region. As the centuries passed, 
the Frankish kingdom saw the rise of the Carolingian dynasty, which would further the work Clovis had begun. It was during the reign of Charlemagne, the most famous Carolingian king, that the concept of a unified Christian empire in Western Europe truly took shape. Charlemagne expanded the Frankish Empire significantly, bringing much of Western and Central Europe under his control. His reign saw the revival of arts, religion, and culture in what is often called the Carolingian Renaissance. The establishment of the French identity, however, was not merely the result of the actions of great kings like Clovis and Charlemagne. It was also a product of the merging of the Gallo-Roman and Frankish cultures. Over generations, these two distinct groups intermingled, their languages, customs and traditions blending to form a new, distinctively French culture. This synthesis was evident in the evolution of the language, as Latin and Old Frankish melded into what would eventually become Old French. It was visible in the realms of art and architecture, where Roman styles merged with Germanic motifs to create unique expressions. Thus, from the chaos of post-Roman Europe, through the ambitions of kings and the slow blending of peoples, a nation was born. The story of the Frankish kingdoms is not just one of conquest and kings. It is a tale of how a diverse land came together to form a collective identity, setting the stage for the rich tapestry of history that France would continue to weave in the centuries to come. Chapter 4 The Sun King's Reign, Louis XIV's Monarchy and the Splendor of Versailles In the tapestry of French history, there are few figures as luminous as Louis XIV, the Sun King, whose reign transformed France into a beacon of art, culture and absolute monarchy. His story is one of grandeur, ambition, and the creation of Versailles, a palace that remains a symbol of royal extravagance. Born in 1638, Louis XIV ascended to the throne at the tender age of four, following the death of his father, Louis XIII. However, it was not until 1661, after the death of his chief minister, that he began to rule in his own right. From that moment, Louis decided that his reign would be marked by absolute control and the splendor of his court. Louis XIV believed that the glory of a king should reflect the glory of France. Under his rule, the French monarchy reached the height of its power and cultural influence. He adopted the sun as his emblem, signifying his role as the center of the nation around which all else revolved. One of his most ambitious projects was the expansion of his father's hunting lodge into the magnificent palace of Versailles. Louis envisioned Versailles not just as a home, but as a seat of government where he could entertain nobility and foreign dignitaries with unmatched opulence. The construction of Versailles was a monumental task. The palace grew under the careful eyes of architects like Louis Laveau and Jules Ardouin Mansart and the celebrated painter Charles Lebrun. Gardens designed by André Le Nôtre stretched as far as the eye could see, filled with elaborate fountains and perfectly manicured lawns. Versailles became the heart of French political life and a symbol of the Sun King's absolute rule. The king orchestrated every detail of court life, from the grand ceremonies of the morning's lever, the king's waking, to the coucher, his retiring, at night. Each moment was designed to display the magnificence and power of the king. But Louis XIV's reign was not just about grandeur. It was also a time of intense political maneuvering. The king skillfully reduced the power of the nobility, requiring them to spend part of each year at Versailles. This kept them under his watchful eye and away from their own bases of power, which limited their ability to challenge him. Louis also patronized the arts like no other king before him. 
he founded the Academy of Dance and the Academy of Music, and his support of the arts led to the flourishing of French culture. Playwrights like Molière, composers like Jean-Baptiste Lully, and painters like Hyacinthe Rigaud thrived under his patronage. The cultural life of France, centered around Versailles, became the envy of Europe. The king's personal life, too, was a subject of fascination and intrigue. His marriage to Maria Theresa of Spain was one of political convenience, but his heart lay with his mistresses, like Louise de la Valliere and Madame de Montespan. The dramas of the court provided endless gossip and speculation among the nobles. Despite the splendor and apparent stability, Louis XIV's reign had its share of challenges. Wars like the War of the Spanish Succession drained French resources and weakened its military. The king's policies, including the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, which had granted rights to the Huguenots, led to economic downturns and the emigration of many skilled and industrious Protestants. In his later years, the costs of building Versailles and his extensive wars began to take a toll on the French treasury. The king who had once dazzled Europe with his riches faced severe financial strains and growing discontent among his people. Louis XIV died in 1715, after 72 years on the throne, leaving behind a legacy of a strengthened monarchy, but also a nation on the brink of financial ruin. Versailles stood as his lasting monument, a palace unmatched in its beauty and a symbol of royal excess. The reign of the Sun King was a pivotal era in French history. It was a time when the monarchy reached the peak of its power and France became a leader in the arts and culture. Yet it also set the stage for the challenges that would culminate in the French Revolution. Louis XIV's story is a reminder of the complexities of absolute power, its brilliance and its shadows, its ability to inspire and to overreach. As we leave the splendor of Versailles, we step into a century of enlightenment and revolution, carrying with us the lessons of the Sun King's court. Chapter 5. Revolution the French Revolution and its worldwide implications. The French Revolution, beginning in 1789, stands as a monumental chapter in the history of France and the world. It was a period of radical change, where old ideas were overthrown and new ones took root, leaving a lasting impact on the course of human events. In the late 18th century, France was a land of stark contrasts. The splendor of the aristocracy, symbolized by the opulent Palace of Versailles, was in sharp contrast to the struggles of the common people, who faced high taxes, food shortages, and the injustices of a rigid social hierarchy. The story of the French Revolution began not with a battle, but with a financial crisis. The extravagant spending of Louis XVI and his predecessors had left the country deeply in debt. To solve this, the king called for a meeting of the Estates General in 1789, bringing together representatives from France's three social classes, the clergy, the nobility, and the common people, or the third estate. The Estates General was a powder keg waiting to explode. The third estate, tired of being outvoted by the clergy and the nobility, proclaimed themselves the National Assembly, vowing to write a new constitution. This act of defiance marked the beginning of the revolution. The tension erupted on July 14, 1789, with the storming of the Bastille, a fortress prison in Paris that symbolized royal authority. The fall of the Bastille was not just a victory, it was a signal that the old order was crumbling. News of the event spread like wildfire, igniting uprisings across the nation. The years that followed were marked by tremendous upheaval. The National Assembly abolished feudalism 
and drafted the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, which proclaimed liberty, equality, and fraternity as the principles of the new France. These ideas were revolutionary, not just for France, but for the whole world, inspiring movements for freedom and equality globally. However, the revolution took a dark turn during the Reign of Terror, led by Maximilien Robespierre and the Committee of Public Safety. In their zeal to root out enemies of the revolution, thousands were executed at the guillotine, including the King and Queen, Louis XVI, and Marie Antoinette. The reign of terror created a climate of fear that eventually led to Robespierre's own downfall. The French Revolution also set the stage for one of the most famous military leaders in history, Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon rose to power amid the chaos of the revolution, eventually declaring himself Emperor of France. His conquests spread the revolutionary ideals across Europe, even as he established a dictatorship at home. The impact of the French Revolution was profound and far-reaching. It dismantled centuries of feudal structure in France, setting the blueprint for a modern nation-state. It also inspired a wave of revolutionary movements across Europe and the Americas as people fought for their rights and freedoms. In Haiti, for instance, the ideas of the French Revolution fueled the Haitian Revolution, which led to the first successful slave rebellion and the establishment of Haiti as an independent nation. In the Americas, revolutionaries like Simon Bolivar looked to France as a model as they fought against Spanish colonial rule. The legacy of the French Revolution is complex. It brought about significant advancements in human rights and democracy, but also periods of great violence and instability. Yet, its core ideals of liberty, equality and fraternity remain powerful forces for change around the world. As we reflect on this tumultuous period, it's clear that the French Revolution was not just about the French people. It was about the human spirit striving for freedom and justice, a struggle that continues in various forms around the globe today. Chapter 6. Napoleon. Bonaparte. A detailed look at his rise and fall. Napoleon Bonaparte a name that resonates through history, not just in France but around the world, embodies the story of rise from obscurity to absolute power, followed by a dramatic fall. His life is a tale of ambition, power, and the eventual consequences of reaching too far. Born in 1769 on the island of Corsica, Napoleon came from modest beginnings. His family was of Italian descent, and though they were not wealthy, they were noble. His path to power began in the military, where he quickly rose through the ranks, thanks to his sharp intellect and a revolutionary France hungry for strong leadership. Napoleon's military genius first shone during the siege of Toulon, where he was given command of the artillery. He cleverly seized strategic points and ousted the British forces earning him recognition and a promotion to brigadier general at the young age of 24. His reputation as a bold and effective leader only grew from there. The young general's rise coincided with the political instability of the French Revolution. In 1799, seizing the moment, Napoleon led a coup that toppled the French Directory, the then government, replacing it with the consulate, where he was first consul. This move effectively made him the ruler of France. His power was further cemented in 1804, when he declared himself Emperor of the French, turning the French Republic into the French Empire. Napoleon's rule brought significant reforms that had lasting impacts. He centralized the administrative, legal, and educational systems with the Napoleonic Code which influenced legal systems worldwide. 
He also bolstered the French economy and expanded the empire beyond France's borders, spreading revolutionary ideals across Europe. However, Napoleon's thirst for expansion led to continuous wars, the Napoleonic Wars, that stretched across Europe. His Grande Armée was nearly invincible for years, defeating coalitions put together by Europe's major powers. He expanded his empire to include parts of Italy, Germany, and annexed the Netherlands, among other territories. His influence was so profound that he even installed his siblings as rulers in some European countries. Despite his success, the seeds of his downfall were sown through the very ambition that had propelled his rise. The turning point came in 1812 with the disastrous invasion of Russia. Napoleon invaded Russia with a massive army, but the harsh Russian winter and scorched earth tactics used by the retreating Russian army decimated his forces. This disastrous campaign marked the beginning of the end of Napoleon's power. His weakened forces were pushed back by renewed coalitions among his enemies. By 1814, Allied forces had invaded France, and Paris fell. Napoleon was forced to abdicate and was exiled to the island of Elba. But his story did not end there. In 1815, Napoleon escaped from Elba and returned to France, rallying support and reclaiming his title of emperor during a period known as the Hundred Days. However, his return was short-lived. He was finally defeated at the Battle of Waterloo, one of the most famous battles in European history. After Waterloo, Napoleon was exiled once more, this time to the remote island of St. Helena in the South Atlantic, where he spent the last years of his life, reflecting on his rise and fall. He died in 1821, leaving behind a complex legacy. His military campaigns had caused widespread devastation, but his administrative reforms had a lasting positive impact on France and on European society. Napoleon's life story is a powerful reminder of how ambition can lead to both extraordinary achievements and profound consequences. His rise from a little-known Corsican to the Emperor of France is a testament to his strategic mind and his ability to capitalize on the opportunities presented by turbulent times. However, his eventual downfall serves as a cautionary tale about the perils of overreach and the unpredictable nature of power. Chapter 7. Artistic France. The development of French art with a focus on the Renaissance. The story of French art, rich and diverse, finds a vivid chapter in the era of the Renaissance. This period marked a reawakening of artistic expression, where France emerged as a center of innovation and beauty, influenced heavily by Italian artists, but also developing its own unique style. During the late 15th and early 16th centuries, as the rest of Europe was being transformed by the Renaissance, France too began to experience a cultural rebirth. The French Renaissance was not merely an imitation of Italian art. It was a blend of local traditions and new ideas, resulting in something entirely unique. The beginning of this artistic revolution in France can be closely tied to the reign of Francis I, a king deeply influenced by Italy's flourishing culture. His reign from 1515 to 1547 was marked by an enthusiastic patronage of the arts and the introduction of the Italian Renaissance style to France. Francis I's fascination with the arts led to the invitation of several Italian artists to his court, including the famed Leonardo da Vinci, who spent his last years in France. One of the most significant contributions of Francis I to French art was the transformation of the Chateau de Fontainebleau, which he turned into a magnificent example of Renaissance architecture. Fontainebleau became a hub for artistic activity, attracting artists from Italy and other parts of Europe. It was here that the unique style known as the School of Fontainebleau was developed, 
characterized by intricate and ornate decoration, elaborate frescoes, and an erotic undercurrent. The school of Fontainebleau was instrumental in shaping French artistic identity. Artists such as Rosso Fiorentino and Francesco Primaticcio created works that decorated the palace's walls and ceilings, blending eroticism with mythology and introducing to France a new level of artistic sophistication. However, the French Renaissance was not confined to the royal courts. It spread across France, influencing other areas such as sculpture and stained glass. The period saw a flourish in the arts that extended to the cathedrals and public buildings throughout the country. In sculpture, artists like Jean Goujon and Germain Pilon brought elegance and emotion to their works, moving away from the rigid styles of the medieval period. Another area where the French Renaissance left its mark was in the realm of manuscript illumination and book production. The introduction of the printing press did not diminish the beauty of handcrafted books. Rather, it allowed for the broader dissemination of works that combined the art of the written word with that of illustration. Publishers like Geoffroy Torrey brought Renaissance humanism to book production, enhancing texts with fonts and decorations inspired by the classics. As the Renaissance progressed, French artists began to develop a style increasingly distinct from their Italian counterparts. This was partly due to the wars of religion that swept through France in the latter part of the 16th century. These conflicts, which set Catholics against Protestants, also influenced the art of the period, bringing a somber tone to the works of the time. The legacy of the French Renaissance is deep and enduring. It set the stage for the classical grandeur of the 17th century and laid the foundations for the philosophical and artistic movements that would follow. The period was marked by a curiosity about the world and a respect for human creativity and intellect. French artists of the Renaissance celebrated beauty and nature, embedding these elements into works that still resonate with viewers today. As we reflect on this flourishing of French art, it's clear that the Renaissance was more than an era of aesthetic development. It was a profound transformation of societal values. It taught the value of looking back to the ancients to understand the modern world and emphasized the importance of humanism, which would echo through the ages in various forms of cultural expression. Through the lens of the Renaissance, we can appreciate the complexity and depth of French art recognizing it as a mirror reflecting the broader changes in society. As we move forward in our journey through the history of French culture, the Renaissance remains a bright beacon of innovation and beauty, reminding us of the power of art to shape and define the identity of a nation. Chapter 8. The Belle Epoque. France at the end of the 19th century, a time of cultural blossoming. The Belle Epoque, or Beautiful Era, was a period of peace and prosperity that swept through France from the late 19th century into the early 20th century. This chapter in French history is marked by a flourishing of the arts, science and culture, making it one of the most vibrant periods in the nation's past. As the shadows of the Franco-Prussian War receded, France embarked on a journey of recovery and rediscovery. Paris, the heart of the nation, transformed into a bustling metropolis of innovation and elegance. The city's streets, lined with newly installed electric lights, shone brightly as cafes, theatres and galleries sprang to life, each adding a stroke to the vibrant canvas of French society. One of the most emblematic symbols of this era was the 1889 World's Fair held in Paris. The fair was a celebration of modernity and innovation, and it was here that the Eiffel Tower was unveiled. Initially criticized by some as a metal monstrosity, 
the tower soon became a beloved icon of Parisian and French identity, symbolizing the nation's forward-looking spirit. Art during the Belle Époque was diverse and dynamic. Impressionism, which had emerged in the latter half of the 19th century, continued to evolve, with artists like Claude Monet and Pierre-Auguste Renoir capturing the transient effects of light and color in their works. These paintings did more than just depict the French landscape. They evoked the essence of the Belle Époque itself, its optimism and its pursuit of beauty. The era also witnessed the birth of Art Nouveau, a style characterized by its organic forms and flowing lines. Architects like Hector Guimard transformed the Parisian landscape with this new aesthetic, most famously through his ornate metro entrances, which seemed to grow from the ground like natural organisms, adorned with elaborate ironwork and glass. Literature thrived as well, with French writers exploring a wide range of themes from the human condition to societal critique. Emile Zola captured the struggles and triumphs of the working class in his novels, while Marcel Proust began his exploration of memory and time in In Search of Lost Time, a literary endeavor that would extend beyond the Belle Epoque and into the heart of the 20th century. Entertainment flourished in the form of cabarets and music halls, where performances ranged from operas to the avant-garde. The Moulin Rouge, opened in 1889, became an emblem of the era's decadent nightlife, where the can-can, a lively and slightly scandalous dance, thrilled audiences night after night. Science and technology also made significant strides during this time. The invention of the cinema by the Lumiere brothers revolutionized entertainment and communication. Their first film, shown in 1895, amazed audiences with moving images of everyday life, a train arriving at a station, workers leaving a factory. This new medium opened up new possibilities for storytelling and documenting reality. The period was also marked by significant advancements in transportation and urban planning. The Paris Metro, inaugurated in 1900, knitted the city closer together, while advancements in automobile technology began to change the streetscape, setting the stage for the modern age. Socially, the Belle Epoque was a time of relative harmony and progress. The rights of workers began to be recognized, leading to improvements in working conditions and the establishment of a more robust social fabric. Women's fashion echoed these changes, with the restrictive corsets of earlier decades giving way to more relaxed styles that allowed for greater freedom of movement. However, beneath the surface of this glittering era, there were undercurrents of tension and challenges that hinted at the upheavals to come in the 20th century. The Dreyfus Affair, a political scandal that rocked France from 1894 to 1906, exposed deep divisions within French society, including anti-Semitism and conflicts over identity and justice. As the Belle Epoque drew to a close with the onset of World War I, the era's end marked the loss of innocence for France and much of Europe. Yet, the legacy of the Belle Epoque lived on in the cultural, artistic, and scientific achievements that continued to influence the world. Reflecting on the Belle Epoque, we see a France at its most radiant, a beacon of art and innovation, a society striving toward the future, yet enjoying every moment of the present. This was a time when France truly seemed to sparkle, its streets alive with the spirit of progress and its nights aglow with the lights of Paris, the city of light. Chapter 9 The Great Wars, France's role in WDWO and Dante II In the history of the 20th century, few events have shaped the world as profoundly as the two world wars. France, with its strategic position in Europe, was at the heart of these conflicts, 
experiencing the full impact of the war's devastations and playing a pivotal role in their outcomes. World War I, the war to end. All wars. World War I, often called the Great War, began in 1914 and lasted until 1918. It was triggered by a complex web of alliances and geopolitical tensions in Europe. France, bound by treaty to Russia, found itself drawn into the conflict after the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary, which set off a chain reaction among the major European powers. The Western Front, a brutal line of trench warfare that stretched from the North Sea to Switzerland, saw some of the war's fiercest fighting. France was the main battleground, with both sides digging into miles of trenches in an attempt to protect their troops from enemy fire. Life in the trenches was harsh and hazardous, marked by a constant threat of death from artillery, snipers, and the dreaded gas attacks. One of the most significant battles for the French was the Battle of Verdun in 1916. It was one of the longest and most intense battles of the war. The German army aimed to bleed France white, targeting a place of profound significance to the French people. The defense of Verdun, led by French General Philippe Pétain, became a symbol of French resilience and determination. Despite the severe casualties, French troops managed to hold the line, turning Verdun into a deadly stalemate. The war took a heavy toll on France, both in terms of human life and economic devastation. The landscape of northern France was scarred with bomb craters and ruined villages, and millions of lives were lost or forever changed. The end of World War I, marked by the signing of the Treaty of Versailles in 1919, left Europe in a fragile state, with many unresolved issues and deep-seated resentments that would eventually lead to another conflict. World War II, a dark chapter. Just two decades later, the world was at war again. World War II began in 1939 when Germany, under Adolf Hitler, invaded Poland. France and Britain declared war on Germany, standing against the aggression that threatened to overrun Europe. The early years of World War II were disastrous for France. In 1940, German forces bypassed the Maginot Line, a line of concrete fortifications, obstacles, and weapon installations built by France along its borders by invading through the Ardennes Forest, a region considered impassable by most military strategists. The rapid German advance, known as the Blitzkrieg or Lightning War, took the Allied forces by surprise, leading to the fall of Paris in June 1940. France was divided into two zones. The occupied zone in the north and west, directly controlled by Germany, and the so-called free zone in the south, governed by the Vichy regime, a puppet government under Marshal Philippe Pétain. The Vichy government collaborated with the Nazis, contributing to the persecution and deportation of Jews and other groups targeted by the Germans. Despite the occupation, the spirit of resistance flourished among the French people. The French resistance, a movement comprising various groups of fighters and informants, conducted sabotage operations, produced underground newspapers, and helped Allied soldiers escape. Their bravery and determination were crucial to undermining German operations in France. The tide of war began to turn with the D-Day landings on June 6, 1944, when Allied forces launched a massive beach assault on Normandy, which was then under German occupation. This operation, involving thousands of ships, aircraft and soldiers, was a critical turning point in the war and led to the liberation of Paris in August 1944. The end of World War II in 1945 marked a victory over tyranny, but at a tremendous cost. France was left to rebuild once more, its cities in ruins, 
its population diminished, and its countryside scarred by battle. Reflections on the Great Wars Looking back at the role of France in the World Wars, we see a nation tested by the extremes of human conflict. Through these dark times, the resilience and courage of the French people shone brightly, from the soldiers in the trenches of Verdun to the resistance fighters of the Nazi occupation. The wars left indelible marks on the French landscape and psyche, shaping the country's post-war identity and its role on the global stage. Chapter 10. The Fourth Republic. Rebuilding France after the war. After the turmoil and devastation of World War II, France faced the monumental task of rebuilding a nation that had been torn apart by conflict and occupation. The period following the war was marked by political restructuring, economic recovery and social reform, encapsulated in the era known as the Fourth Republic, the birth of the Fourth Republic. The Fourth Republic was officially established in 1946, following a referendum that dissolved the provisional government which had been in place since the liberation of France in 1944. The new constitution aimed to create a more stable and democratic governance structure, reflecting the desires of a population eager to move away from the authoritarian shadows of the Vichy regime. The Fourth Republic was characterized by its parliamentary system, which unfortunately led to political instability due to the fragmentation of the French political landscape. Numerous parties, ranging from communists to conservatives, struggled to gain a majority, resulting in frequent changes of government. Despite these challenges, the Fourth Republic was a time of significant reconstruction and modernization, which set the foundation for the modern French state, rebuilding the nation. One of the most urgent tasks was the physical reconstruction of the country. Cities like Paris, Lyon and Marseille had suffered extensive damage during the war, and many smaller towns and villages had been almost entirely destroyed. The government launched a massive rebuilding program, which not only focused on repairing damaged infrastructure, but also modernizing it to meet the needs of the post-war era. This period saw the introduction of significant social welfare programs, including the establishment of the French social security system. Inspired by the principles of the National Council of Resistance, these reforms aim to provide all citizens with protection against the risks of sickness, old age, and unemployment. Education reform was also a priority, with efforts made to expand access to education and improve the quality of schools across the country. Economic Challenges and Recovery Economically, France was in dire straits at the end of World War II. The war had drained financial resources, and the industrial base had been weakened by years of occupation and sabotage. To address these challenges, the French government embarked on a series of ambitious economic plans known as the Monet Plan, named after Jean Monet, a leading architect of European cooperation. The Monet Plan focused on reviving key industries such as coal, steel and agriculture. It also aimed at improving transportation and energy infrastructure to support economic growth. This plan was largely financed by the Marshall Plan, through which the United States provided substantial financial aid to help rebuild Western European economies. The success of these initiatives helped to stimulate a period of rapid economic growth known as the Trente Glorieuses or the Thirty Glorious Years, which would last until the early 1970s. Cultural Renaissance Culturally, the post-war period was marked by a renaissance in French arts and letters. The existentialist philosophy of Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir, which explored themes of freedom, responsibility and alienation, resonated with a generation grappling with the horrors of war 
and the challenges of rebuilding. In cinema, the French New Wave brought fresh creativity and innovation to the screen. With directors like François Truffaut and Jean-Luc Godard, breaking away from traditional storytelling techniques. Challenges and the transition to the Fifth Republic. Despite these successes, the Fourth Republic faced numerous challenges that it ultimately could not overcome. The political instability hindered effective governance, and the colonial wars, particularly in Indochina and Algeria, placed immense strain on the country's resources and morale. The escalating crisis in Algeria, where calls for independence had erupted into a full-blown conflict, proved to be the final straw for the Fourth Republic. The inability of the successive governments to resolve the crisis led to a loss of confidence among the military and the public. In 1958, amidst political chaos and the threat of a coup, Charles de Gaulle was called back to power and established the Fifth Republic, which featured a stronger presidential system. Reflections on the Fourth Republic The Fourth Republic, despite its shortcomings, was a period of vital importance in the history of France. It was a time of rebuilding and renewal, in which the nation laid down the economic, social and cultural foundations that would support its future growth and stability. The efforts during this era to rebuild a war-torn country and to establish a more just and stable society are a testament to the resilience and determination of the French people. Chapter 11, May 1968 The Student Revolutions and Cultural Upheaval May 1968 remains one of the most iconic months in French history, symbolizing a period of intense social and cultural upheaval. What began as a series of student protests exploded into a massive working-class movement, presenting a formidable challenge to the established social order and leaving a lasting impact on French society. The Spark of Rebellion the story of May 1968 began in the universities of Paris. It was a time of intellectual ferment, influenced by various global movements for civil rights, anti-war protests, and an emerging counterculture that questioned traditional values. The immediate spark for the protests was the closure and police invasion of the Nanterre University near Paris, where students were demonstrating against overcrowding poor conditions, and the authoritarian nature of the educational system. The unrest quickly spread to the Sorbonne University in Paris, a venerable institution that soon became the epicenter of the uprising. The response of the authorities, who called in the police to quell the protests, only fueled the anger of the students, leading to street battles in the Latin Quarter. Barricades were erected and cobblestones flew as students clashed with police in scenes that recalled the revolutionary fervor of 1848 and 1871. Escalation and the General Strike What distinguished May 1968 was how quickly the student protests escalated into a broader social movement. By mid-May, the unrest had spread beyond the universities to factories and other workplaces. Workers, inspired by the students' call for radical change, began to strike. The strikes were not just demands for better wages and working conditions. They echoed the students' deeper calls for societal change, challenging the capitalist system and the Gaullist government. The climax of this movement came when millions of workers across France went on strike, effectively paralyzing the country. Factories shut down, public transport came to a halt, and daily life was disrupted on an unprecedented scale. This general strike was the largest in French history, and created a sense of crisis that some believed could lead to a revolutionary change of government. Cultural and Ideological Battles the movements of May 1968 were as much cultural as they were political. The protesters, 
primarily young people, were not only demanding changes to policies and leadership, but were also challenging the very values of French society. They sought a more egalitarian society, greater personal freedoms, and a break from the conservative norms that had shaped their parents' world. The slogans and graffiti that appeared on walls across Paris reflected this desire for change. Be realistic, demand the impossible, under the paving stones, the beach, and imagination takes power. These phrases captured the revolutionary spirit of the time, a blend of deep political dissatisfaction and a utopian desire for a new society. The government's response and the aftermath. The response of President Charles de Gaulle to the May 1968 events was initially uncertain, reflecting the surprise and severity of the crisis. However, by the end of May, he had regained his composure and took decisive steps to restore order. De Gaulle dissolved the National Assembly and called for new parliamentary elections. Surprisingly to many, his party emerged victorious, a result that showed a significant portion of the population still favoured stability over radical change. Despite the political recovery of de Gaulle's government, the events of May 1968 had a lasting impact on French society. They led to significant reforms in education and labour laws and helped shift social attitudes towards more liberal values, especially concerning sex, family and authority. Reflections on May 1968 Looking back on May 1968, we see a pivotal moment in the modern history of France. It was a time when the younger generation, disillusioned with the constraints and conventions of traditional society, rose up to voice their hopes and frustrations. While they may not have achieved the revolutionary changes they envisioned, they indelibly changed the cultural and political landscape of France. May 1968 remains a symbol of resistance and the power of collective action. It is remembered not just for the barricades and the strikes, but for the awakening of a society to new possibilities and the realization that change, often driven by the youth, is an essential part of the democratic experience. As we move forward in our exploration of French history, the legacy of May 1968 continues to remind us of the enduring impact of civic engagement and cultural bravery. Chapter 12. Modern Leaders, from Charles de Gaulle to the Present The leadership of France has seen remarkable figures since the time of Charles de Gaulle, each leaving their unique imprint on both the nation and the broader stage of world politics. This chapter explores the lives and contributions of these leaders, navigating through periods of change and challenge, and shaping modern France in their distinct ways. Charles de Gaulle, the founder of the Fifth Republic. Charles de Gaulle emerged as a pivotal figure during and after World War II. Known for his resolute personality and visionary leadership, de Gaulle set the stage for the modern French state. After leading the Free French Forces against the Nazis, he later established the Fifth Republic in 1958, becoming its first president. His leadership was marked by efforts to restore France's stature on the world stage, pursuing an independent foreign policy distinct from American and Soviet influences. De Gaulle's tenure also saw the resolution of the Algerian crisis, granting independence to Algeria and ending a brutal conflict. François Mitterrand, a turn to the left. Following several interim leaders who grappled with economic challenges and social changes, François Mitterrand took office in 1981 as the first socialist president of the Fifth Republic. His presidency was marked by a series of progressive reforms, including the abolition of the death penalty, the decentralization of government authority, and the expansion of welfare benefits. 
Mitterrand also faced considerable economic difficulties, which forced a policy shift mid-term from expansionist economic policies to more conservative ones. Despite these challenges, he remained a figure of resilience, serving two terms and leaving behind a legacy of significant cultural projects, including the Grand Louvre, with its iconic glass pyramid. Jacques Chirac, consolidating the centre-right. Jacques Chirac served as the President of France from 1995 to 2007. His leadership was characterised by a pragmatic approach to domestic policy and a robust foreign policy. Chirac was known for his opposition to the 2003 Iraq War, positioning France as a leading voice against the invasion. Domestically, his tenure was marked by efforts to strengthen social cohesion and reduce social inequalities, although economic reforms often met with public resistance and were a source of considerable controversy. Nicolas Sarkozy, a dynamic reformer. Nicolas Sarkozy, who served from 2007 to 2012, was known for his energetic style and focus on reforming France's labour laws and pension systems. His presidency was aimed at revitalising the French economy with a blend of liberal and conservative measures. Sarkozy also placed a strong emphasis on law and order issues and took a hard stance on immigration and national security, policies that sometimes polarised public opinion. François Hollande, steering through crisis. Taking office in 2012, François Hollande faced a myriad of challenges, including economic stagnation and terrorist attacks that shook the nation. His administration focused on economic reforms and employment initiatives, though his attempts to invigorate the economy had mixed results. Holland's presidency was also marked by significant legislation in social policy, notably legalizing same-sex marriage. Emmanuel Macron, a new generation of leadership. The current president, Emmanuel Macron, represents a new generation of leadership. Elected in 2017 as the youngest president in French history, Macron's approach mixes liberal economic policies with a strong commitment to European integration. His presidency has been marked by efforts to reform the labour market, reduce public sector spending and enhance France's competitiveness globally. Macron's leadership style is proactive and forward-thinking, but has also sparked significant public demonstrations and strikes over his proposed reforms. Reflections on Leadership Looking at these leaders collectively, we see a narrative of resilience, reform and redefinition. Each president faced distinct challenges and opportunities, shaping their policies and their legacies. From de Gaulle's foundational leadership in the post-war era to Macron's contemporary vision for France in a globalised world, the journey of French leadership is one of adaptation and perseverance. This exploration of France's modern leaders provides not just a political history, but also a mirror reflecting the changing hopes and concerns of the French people over decades. As France continues to evolve, the leadership of these figures remains a testament to the complexities of governing and the continuous effort to define and refine the ideals of the Republic. Chapter 13 French Cuisine an exploration of how French food has shaped global dining. French cuisine is celebrated worldwide for its finesse and flavour, embodying a tradition of culinary excellence that has influenced global dining in profound ways. From the bustling markets of Paris to the vineyards of Bordeaux, French food is about much more than meals. It is a way of life, the roots of French culinary prestige. The story of French cuisine begins in the royal courts, where lavish banquets displayed the wealth and power of France's monarchy. Over time, these elaborate styles of cooking were adapted by chefs who began to focus not only on the presentation, but also on the quality and subtlety of flavours. In the 17th century, 
Chef François Pierre Lavarenne authored Le Cuisinier François, the cookbook that revolutionized French cooking by emphasizing fresh ingredients, balanced flavors, and simpler preparations. This marked the move away from heavily spiced medieval dishes toward what can be recognized today as modern French cuisine. The Influence of French Chefs French chefs have long been considered as artisans and visionaries in the kitchen. One of the most iconic figures in the culinary world was Auguste Escoffier, who in the late 19th and early 20th centuries modernized and codified recipes that served as the backbone for what is now known as haute cuisine. His emphasis on the art of cooking and the organization of the kitchen made French cuisine synonymous with refinement and excellence. Escoffier also introduced the concept of the brigade system in kitchens, a hierarchical structure that streamlined operations and is still used in restaurants worldwide today. His approach to cooking and kitchen management significantly influenced how restaurants operate, promoting a level of professionalism that elevated the culinary profession on a global scale. French dishes and their global journey Classic French dishes have traveled beyond France's borders, inspiring chefs and delighting palates around the world. Consider the baguette, with its golden crust and soft, airy interior, or the croissant, flaky and rich with butter. These staples of French baking have become beloved across continents. In the realm of fine dining, dishes such as coq au vin, a slow-cooked chicken dish with wine, mushrooms and onions, and bouillabaisse, a fragrant seafood stew from Marseille, have showcased the depth and diversity of French cuisine. These dishes do more than feed. They tell stories of the regions they come from each ingredient narrating a piece of French culinary history. French Techniques, the Backbone of Culinary Arts The techniques developed in French kitchens such as braising, sautéing and flambéing have taught generations of chefs around the world how to cook. French culinary techniques are often considered essential knowledge in many culinary schools emphasizing skills that are fundamental to many other cuisines. The meticulous technique of making sauces, a hallmark of French cuisine, is particularly influential. The five mother sauces, bechamel, velute, espagnole, hollandaise and tomato, serve as base sauces from which numerous other variations are derived, demonstrating the French approach to building complex flavors. French cuisine in the global dining scene. Today, French cuisine holds a place of high esteem in the global dining scene. It is often associated with luxury and celebration, reserved for moments that call for something extraordinary. Many of the world's top-rated restaurants serve French dishes or employ techniques rooted in French culinary tradition. Moreover, the inclusion of French gastronomy on the UNESCO Intangible Cultural Heritage List in 2010 underscores its importance and influence. This recognition helps preserve culinary techniques and traditions that are central to French culture and highlights the role of food in bringing people together. Reflections on French Cuisine's Global Legacy As we explore the impact of French cuisine, it becomes clear that its influence extends beyond recipes and cooking styles. It is about an attitude toward food that honors flavor, craftsmanship, and the joy of eating. The French have long celebrated the ritual of dining, emphasizing that the experience of eating is as important as the food itself. French cuisine's journey from royal courts to cafes and fine dining establishments around the world tells a story of evolution, art, and influence. It reflects a legacy that continues to inspire chefs and food lovers, ensuring that the spirit of French cooking remains vibrant and cherished across the globe. Through the lens of French cuisine, we not only learn about a rich culinary tradition, but also about France's ability to influence and meld with other cultures, 
making it a compelling chapter in the story of global dining. As we continue our exploration of French culture and its contributions to the world, the flavors of France remind us of the universal language of good food and shared meals. Chapter 14. Fashion and France. How France became a world fashion hub. France, particularly Paris, is synonymous with fashion, having established itself as a global epicenter of haute couture and ready-to-wear styles. This chapter delves into how France achieved this prestigious position in the fashion world, weaving through the tapestry of history, creativity, and cultural influence that defines French fashion. The origins of French fashion dominance. The journey of French fashion begins in the royal courts of the 17th century, where King Louis XVI reigned supreme. Known as the Sun King, Louis XVI used fashion as a tool of both politics and persuasion, making the court of Versailles a stage for displaying the wealth and sophistication of his reign. He encouraged lavish costumes and elaborate hairstyles, believing that the splendor of his court should reflect the power of France itself. This period established the foundations of the French textile industry, which began producing luxurious fabrics like silk, lace, and brocade. These materials became highly sought after across Europe, setting a precedent for French leadership in quality and style. The Rise of Haute Couture The term haute couture was coined in the 19th century, embodied by the work of Charles Frederick Worth, an Englishman who revolutionized Parisian fashion. Worth was the first to establish the concept of the fashion designer as an artist and not just a tailor. He created unique garments for his high society clients, pioneering the practice of sewing branded labels into his creations. Worth's innovations laid the groundwork for the haute couture industry, which involves creating exclusive, tailor-made clothing. He also introduced the idea of seasonal collections, presenting them in fashion, shows that would become a staple in the industry. His legacy was a structured system, where fashion became a meticulously planned art form, leading to the birth of numerous luxury fashion houses in Paris. Paris as a fashion capital. By the early 20th century, Paris had cemented its status as the fashion capital of the world. Designers like Coco Chanel, Christian Dior, and Yves Saint Laurent became household names, each contributing uniquely to the fashion landscape. Chanel introduced the world to the chic simplicity of the little black dress, while Dior brought glamour and volume with the new look after World War II. Saint Laurent broke new ground with his ready-to-wear line, democratizing fashion by blending high fashion with practicality. These designers shared a common thread. They all showcased their work in Paris, drawing buyers, celebrities, and photographers from around the globe. The biannual Paris Fashion Week became a pivotal event, not just for designers to exhibit their latest collections, but as a cultural phenomenon that influenced trends worldwide, French fashion and global influence. The influence of French fashion extends beyond the runways. It has shaped global perceptions of beauty, luxury, and style. French fashion houses like Louis Vuitton, Chanel, and Hermes are not just brands. They are symbols of quality and craftsmanship, commanding loyalty and admiration from consumers worldwide. Moreover, France's influence is evident in the spread of fashion schools and institutes, like Paris's École de la Chambre Syndicale de la Couture Parisienne, which has trained many notable designers. These institutions maintain high standards of artistic and technical excellence, attracting students from across the world who wish to imbibe the French aesthetic and craftsmanship. Challenges and Resilience Despite its prestigious position, the French fashion industry has faced challenges such as economic downturns, 
competition from global brands, and the increasing pace of consumer trends. However, it has shown remarkable resilience, continually adapting to new technologies and changing market dynamics while maintaining its commitment to quality and innovation. Reflections on Fashion and France As we reflect on how France became a world fashion hub, it's clear that French fashion is more than just clothing. It is an expression of culture and history. It involves a deep understanding of craftsmanship, a commitment to pushing creative boundaries, and a relentless pursuit of aesthetic perfection. Chapter 15. French Cinema. Key Moments and Figures in French Film History. French cinema is renowned for its rich history and contribution to the global film industry. From pioneering early film techniques to influencing modern cinematic movements, France has played a pivotal role in shaping how stories are told on the silver screen. The Dawn of Cinema. The story of French cinema begins with the Lumiere brothers, Auguste and Louis, who are credited with inventing the motion picture. In 1895, they held the first public movie screening of a series of short scenes from everyday French life. This historic event took place in Paris and marked the birth of cinema as a form of entertainment. The Lumiere brothers' invention was not just a technological breakthrough. It was the spark that ignited a new form of art, the silent film era. During the silent film era, French cinema flourished with artists like Georges Méli, who was among the first to realize the potential of cinema for imaginative storytelling. Méli's, a magician by trade, used innovative special effects to create fantastical worlds in films such as A Trip to the Moon, 1902. His work laid the groundwork for narrative-driven films and was instrumental in moving the medium beyond simple recordings of everyday events. The advent of sound and the poetic realism. The introduction of sound to film brought a new dimension to the cinematic experience. French filmmakers embraced this change, leading to the period of poetic realism in the 1930s. This movement, characterized by its focus on working-class characters and fatalistic themes, was led by directors like Jean Renoir and Marcel Kahn. Films such as The Grand Illusion, 1937, by Renoir and Children of Paradise, 1945, by Kahn, combined social commentary with a lyrical style that enriched French cinema's narrative depth, the French New Wave. Perhaps the most influential movement in French cinema was the French New Wave of the 1950s and 1960s. Disenchanted with traditional filmmaking conventions, directors like François Truffaut and Jean-Luc Godard sought to revolutionize cinema with a fresh approach to storytelling and film techniques. Truffaut's The 400 Blows, 1959, and Godard's Breathless, 1960, showcased a youthful freedom and innovative narrative styles that challenged the norms of classical cinema. The new wave's impact was profound, influencing filmmakers around the world and forever changing the landscape of film art. Modern French cinema In recent decades, French cinema has continued to produce films that resonate both domestically and internationally. Directors such as Luc Besson and Jean-Pierre Junet have enjoyed global success with films like Leon, The Professional, 1994, and Amélie, 2001, which blend elements of French artistic sensibility with broad cross-cultural appeal. Meanwhile, contemporary filmmakers like Céline Sciamma and Laj Lee explore diverse narratives and social issues, highlighting the evolving landscape of French society. The Role of French Cinema Festivals French cinema is also celebrated and promoted through numerous film festivals. The Cannes Film Festival, founded in 1946, is one of the most prestigious and well-known film festivals in the world. 
It has been a crucial platform for showcasing new films and talent, not just from France, but from across the globe. This festival, along with others like the César Awards, the French equivalent of the Oscars, highlights the ongoing importance of France in the global film community. Reflections on French cinema. Reflecting on the history of French cinema reveals a medium that has continually evolved, mirroring changes in French society and politics. Each era brought new styles and techniques that contributed to the broader tapestry of film history. French filmmakers have consistently pushed the boundaries of what cinema can achieve, from the fantastical flights of Méliès to the stark realism of the new wave and into the modern diversity of today's cinematic voices. French cinema's story is not just about the development of a national cinema, but about the contribution of France to the art of film worldwide. It demonstrates how film, as a form of cultural expression, can capture the human experience in its myriad forms. As French cinema continues to evolve, it remains a vital part of the international dialogue about film, offering unique perspectives and enriching the global cinema narrative. Chapter 16 Tour de France, the story behind the world's most famous cycling race. The Tour de France is not just a cycling race, it is a national event that captivates the world, showcasing not only the physical endurance of the cyclists, but also the stunning landscapes of France. From its humble beginnings to becoming the premier cycling event globally, the Tour de France has a rich history filled with drama, triumph, and sometimes controversy. The origins of the Tour the Tour de France was conceived in 1903 by Henri de Grange, a journalist and cycling enthusiast, as a way to boost sales for his newspaper, Lauto. The idea was to create a cycling race that was longer and more challenging than any other existing event. The first Tour de France was a grueling six-stage race that stretched over 2,400 kilometers, starting in Paris and passing through Lyon, Marseille, Bordeaux, and Nantes, before returning to Paris. The race was an immediate success, drawing cyclists and spectators from across the nation. The competitors were not just professional cyclists, but adventurers willing to endure the punishing roads of early 20th century France for the thrill of competition and the lure of victory. The Evolution of the Tour over the years, the Tour de France evolved significantly. The number of stages increased, and the route was extended to cover more of the country, including climbs in the Alps and the Pyrenees, which are now among the highlights of the race. These mountain stages added a dramatic element to the Tour, testing the cyclists' endurance and strategic prowess to the limits. The tour also began to attract international competitors, transforming from a national event into a global spectacle. Advances in technology and training methods improved the performance of the riders, while developments in media coverage expanded the race's audience worldwide. Iconic Moments and Figures The Tour de France has been a stage for many of cycling's most legendary figures. One of the earliest stars was Jacques Anquetil, known for his time-trialing prowess and strategic mind, who won the Tour five times in the 1950s and 1960s. His rivalry with Raymond Poulidor, who was beloved for his tenacity and was known as the Eternal Second, captivated the French public. Another towering figure was Eddie Merckx, nicknamed the Cannibal, for his competitive drive who also won the Tour five times and dominated the race in the early 1970s. His all-around ability in climbing, sprinting and time-trialing made him nearly unbeatable when he was in his prime. In more recent years, the Tour has seen heroes like Miguel Indurain, who won five consecutive tours in the 1990s, and Lance Armstrong, 
whose seven consecutive wins were later stripped due to doping violations. These controversies brought attention to the darker side of competitive cycling, including the pressures and the lengths to which some athletes will go to win. Challenges and Triumphs The Tour de France is not without its challenges, from the physical and mental strain on the cyclists to external factors like the weather and the condition of the roads. The race has also faced significant challenges, such as doping scandals, which have led to reforms and stricter anti-doping measures to preserve the sport's integrity. Despite these challenges, the spirit of the Tour de France remains resilient. Every year, it brings together the best cyclists in the world, each competing not only for the yellow jersey, the symbol of the race leader, but also for the personal triumph of completing one of the most demanding athletic challenges in the world. The Cultural Impact of the Tour Beyond the competition, the Tour de France has a profound cultural impact. It showcases the beautiful scenery of France, from quaint villages to majestic mountains, broadcasting these images to millions of viewers worldwide and boosting tourism. The race also inspires amateur cyclists everywhere to pursue their passion for cycling, promoting a spirit of fitness and perseverance. Reflections on the Tour de France The Tour de France is more than just a race. It is a celebration of resilience, a testament to human limits, and a yearly event that unites people across the globe. Its story is one of triumph over adversity, of spectacular feats of physical and mental endurance, and of the beauty and spirit of competition. As we look forward to future editions of the tour, we remember the legends who have peddled through pain and glory and anticipate the new heroes who will emerge. The legacy of the Tour de France continues to inspire, proving that it is indeed much more than a cycling race. It is a human drama played out on the vast, varied landscapes of France. Chapter 17 Contemporary France Current Challenges and Achievements In the ever-evolving story of France, the contemporary chapter is filled with both significant achievements and formidable challenges. This period reflects a nation at the crossroads of tradition and innovation, grappling with modern issues while striving to maintain its cultural identity and global influence. Economic Challenges and Innovations One of the foremost challenges facing contemporary France is economic fluctuation. Like many other nations, France has experienced economic highs and lows, influenced by global markets and internal policies. Unemployment rates have been a persistent issue, particularly among the youth and in economically depressed areas. However, the French government has implemented various initiatives aimed at stimulating economic growth and innovation, focusing on technology and the green economy. France has emerged as a leader in the renewable energy sector, with significant investments in wind and solar power. The country is also at the forefront of nuclear technology, providing a substantial portion of its electricity from nuclear energy, which positions it uniquely in debates on sustainable energy. Social Cohesion and Immigration France's rich cultural tapestry is woven from diverse threads, but this diversity has also presented challenges in terms of social cohesion. Immigration and integration have been central issues, with debates often focusing on how to balance national security with human rights. The French model of laicite, or secularism, is a cornerstone of the Republic's approach to maintaining a neutral public sphere where all citizens can coexist regardless of background. However, this model has been tested in recent years, prompting discussions about cultural identity and inclusivity. Despite these tensions, France has made strides toward inclusivity. For example, 
Education programs focusing on integration and French language acquisition have been key to helping new immigrants join the mainstream. Additionally, there are numerous grassroots initiatives that promote intercultural dialogue and understanding. Technological Advancement and the Digital Economy In the realm of technology, France has made significant advances and is keen on establishing itself as a startup hub. Initiatives like Le French Tech aim to propel French startups onto the global stage, fostering innovation in sectors such as artificial intelligence, biotechnology, and cybersecurity. The government has also supported this vision through funding and regulatory support, aiming to make France an attractive destination for entrepreneurs and tech talent. Healthcare system and response to global challenges. The French healthcare system, renowned for its accessibility and quality, has faced the global challenge of aging populations and the recent pressures of the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic tested the resilience of France's health infrastructure, but also highlighted the strengths of its universal healthcare system. The response to health crises has been robust, with significant investments in healthcare technology and personnel training ensuring that France remains at the cutting edge of medical research and patient care. Cultural Achievements and Global Influence Culturally, France continues to be a beacon of arts and literature, maintaining its status as one of the world's premier cultural centres. French cinema, fashion and gastronomy continue to influence global trends and practices. Paris often called the capital of fashion, hosts several major fashion weeks that continue to set worldwide trends. Additionally, French literature and philosophy maintain a strong presence in global discussions, reflecting the country's ongoing commitment to intellectual exploration. EEA, environmental leadership. On the environmental front, France has taken a leadership role particularly in addressing climate change. It was a pivotal player in the 2015 Paris Agreement, and it continues to advocate for global environmental governance. Domestically, France has committed to reducing carbon emissions and has implemented policies aimed at decreasing reliance on fossil fuels, enhancing waste management, and preserving its biodiverse landscapes. Conclusion a forward-looking France. As France faces the challenges of the 21st century, it does so with an eye toward innovation and inclusivity, drawing on its rich history of cultural depth and revolutionary spirit. The achievements of contemporary France, from economic resilience and technological innovation to cultural richness and environmental stewardship, illustrate a nation that, despite its challenges, remains committed to playing a vital role on the global stage.